Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay. So I want to share with with you guys uh, one of my recent works on um, personalized medicine. Okay, this work was actually led by my PhD student Jin Li, and she is actually sitting over there. <laughs> okay, that's true. So this paper is about uh, subgroup identification, <coughs> and we try to use a statistical model, and uh, under the model structure, we can have some sensible grouping uh, characteristics. So this may help uh, people uh, doing better treatment. Okay, so this page of slides is mainly to motivate the idea of personalized <coughs> medicine. Okay, if for people who are not experts, I perhaps will spend five minutes talking about this. But I think most people in this room are already quite familiar uh, with this idea, so I'll just be very quick, very quick. So, you know, the idea here is we want to, so, uh, nowadays the treatment is getting more and more person, personalized, and we realize uh, you just provide one kind of drug or one size of drug to everybody is not a good idea. And we should concentrate on specific groups of patients. If we want to provide specific treatments for those group of patients, then sometimes it may work better if you can identify those groups. So there are many factors that could play in this kind of work. And in recent, uh, this kind of uh, this kind of subgroup uh, analysis or personalized medicine is becoming possible only because of the recent advancement in genomics, computer, computational biology, medical imaging, and uh, regenerative medicine. So this makes all this kind of uh, applied research or targeted therapy more more feasible. So once people are grouped into different subcategories, sub then you can provide more specific treatment to those guys. Okay, so the, here the idea is, if you can find the subgroups, then you, uh, you are done. You have found the meaningful uh, ways to do personalized medicine. But how do we, so here is a statistical question, how do we find the subgroups? Okay, so <laughs> of course we need to identify the groups by using the information we have, right? The information we have is just the data we collected in experiments or observational studies. So here we try to use a, a regression framework. So you, we would have response and we have outcome. We will have response with Y, which is our outcome we are interested. And then we have a bunch of predictors, X1, X2, up to XP. So this is a usual regression setting. Okay, so now if you want to find out uh, subgroups, then you can, these subgroups could form in different patterns. Then how should we find, a, find those subgroups, right? So this idea, uh, of course, it should be based on the data you have. So here is one very hypothetical example just from our simulation study. It's one of our simulation setting. You see, in this picture, I showed you four scatter plots. Okay, the y-axis is the same. It's a response variable. And x-axis are four predictors, x1, x2, x3, and x4. Those four predictors are used to generate the response variable y. And uh, we are designing the experiments, so we know who is from group one, who is from group two, and so on. Right? We have three groups in this simulation setup. Okay, so we know the subgroups for sure. And then you can, you can tell from these graphs some variables are more helpful to differentiate the groups than other variables, right? If you look at x1, then the three variables, the three groups are just mixing around. You don't really, you can re cannot really tell uh, uh, the difference of these three groups. x2 also is very hard to tell the difference. But like uh, x3 and x4, it's perhaps much more clear uh, on how to differentiate the different categories, different groups. So when we are choosing the subgroups, it's actually quite important to first select what kind of variable you use to divide the subjects into subgroups. So that's an that's important question we want to look at in this project. Okay, so before our work, 
there is actually an ocean of publications in this area. So there are already many, many uh, papers published uh, for this subgroup uh, identification problem. Most of the earlier publications are related to uh, decision tree. So they are all the algorithms, all the subgroup identification methods are kind of like building a regression tree or classification tree. And uh, you use the recursive partitioning algorithm and build a different uh, uh, knots. You, you get a different um, splits of your original sample and eventually end up with small groups. And those groups will be used for subgroups. Okay, so the earliest algorithm is called this AID, and then we have this THAID. <laughs> so, and after that, we have CART. You see, these are very ancient uh, algorithms. And more recently, it's GUIDE. GUIDE is more re relatively most recent algorithm. And, but GUIDE is also just another regression tree, but it's just to use local polynomial for the different um, uh, regions. Okay, it's also related to regression tree. And also this model-based <laughs> recursive partitioning, it's also based on tree. And the interaction tree, it's also tree methods. And sites methods and VT methods, those, are, those two are the most recent one. They were developed like in 2016 or 2017. So very, very recent. So all these works, uh, they, they have very good performance in practice. They are, many of them are already applied in clinical trials, in, in clinical studies and uh, they have received uh, a lot of attention already. And uh, so, uh, yeah, all these uh, works has been published and has been used. So just the things that, uh, so we just, uh, uh, actually to tell you guys, <laughs> uh, like it's like one or two years ago, exactly in this, uh, in this room, in this uh, uh, lecture hall, actually most of the developers of this methods, and they are actually sitting in this room exactly. They are having a workshop on personalized medicine. So I was uh, fortunate to be, be able to hear what they are talking about. Uh, and then I realized it's a very interesting uh, area. And then I also realized what I was doing right then uh, was actually quite related to them, even though I was developing some kind of very theoretical statistical models. But then I realized it can actually also be applied for this purpose, for this personalized medicine. So that's when I asked my student to start developing the following <laughs> works. And uh, yeah, it's built from the earlier works. And all those early, earlier works, they are already br brilliant. Okay. Okay. So our work is slightly different from those earlier works because we try to use a change point uh, methods. And uh, in this kind of change, for, change point framework, it's actually not new to statistician. But most of the time, change point has been used in economics. Okay, for time series analysis, people use uh, change point detection methods all the time. Okay, so they try to find the year-year difference. We try to find what's where there is a financial cycle, where there is important uh, breaking structure. So from the time series, so that's a long standing problem in statistics. And many, many people have contributed in that area. But what we are doing here is try to use this change point framework into a regression setting. And then under this regression setting, we can form uh, subgroups very naturally. Okay, so then you need to realize in this area, in this change point estimation area, uh, usually there are two uh, steps, two important questions we need to answer. Okay, the first question is, we want to decide the total number of change points. Okay, that number is not a Euclidean parameter. It has to be decided, it has to be estimated. But this quantity is just a number. Okay, so the estimation for this number is usually very hard. If there is only one change point, then that's very easy. Okay, you usually, you just need to answer the second question. <laughs> the second question is you find the location of the change points accurately. <coughs> okay, but if you don't know how many change points are there, then that's actually a tougher question. You need to first find out their locations first. Okay, so these two questions must be answered. Okay, so um, even for the change point literature, there are many uh, um, important methods that, that have been uh, 
proposed in the literature. One type of methods that is very popular is the cumulative sum methods. So, so some kind of binary segmentation method is use some kind of iterative cumulative sums to do, just keep uh, dividing the interval into uh, two parts and then do the splitting repeatedly. Uh, this kind of method is very accurate from what, what's reported in the literature. It's very accurate, but it tend to be time consuming. Okay, so the recent authors try to use a penalization method so that it can uh, improve the calculation speed. So that's also what we are gonna adopt here. We're, we're also using penalty methods. Okay, <laughs> so in this paper, we are actually more, more interested in finding the thresholding variable. So using what variable to split a sample is actually more important in this project because other pieces has been well constructed already. So we are just borrowing existing uh, approaches into this project. So those, those things are not new. But what's new here is we hear about the threshold variable. We want to find out uh, appropriate variable to use to split a sample. You see, for example, in economics, if you you do time series analysis, the spreading variable, the, the, the thresholding variable is just a time. Okay, you just look at whether the time is below 1995 or after 1995. So time is a variable you use to split a sample. So you separate the time series into two parts by looking at the time. So that's very natural. Okay, but in medical studies, in clinical studies, we have so many variables not just time, okay, you, have, you, you can use age, you can use a person's age, you can use body heights, body weights, or other genetic information, right? So everything you collected can be used as a thresholding variable. So here we want to extend the earlier works so that we can incorporate more or more important uh, variables in, into this thresholding variable. So this is kind of similar to the tree methods where you have to decide the splitting variable. So in the tree methods, you also need to uh, consider for, for what variable you do the splitting. You, uh, okay, there, there is some similarity in that sense. All right, so now let me introduce the model we are trying to study, okay, in this project. It's a just, just very simple regression model. It's a very simple linear regression model. Basically, it's just a piecewise linear model. In this piecewise linear model, you can see, okay, depending on the value of z, okay, depending on the z value of z, the regression coefficients for x will be different. So this beta is not a constant for all the groups. So beta has a subscript j here. here. This J depends on the change point. Okay, depending on which change, change point you are talking about, then this beta J will be different. So A1, A2, up to AS plus one, those are the change points uh, for Z. So in, in, in this model framework, it's kind of, we are looking at the spectrum of this Z variable. We look at the, <coughs> the range of the Z variables. A, Z, A, a1 is the smallest change point, A2 is the second one, and A3 is the next one. So we have this kind of change points. And these change points divide the region of Z into uh, totally S regions. And so in these S regions, we will have um, different regression coefficients, basically. You see, if, if I tell you the change points, if A are all given, if A are all known, then this problem is very simple. It's, you can solve this problem just using undergraduate linear, linear algebra, okay, it's just a linear regression analysis. It's just a piecewise linear model. But the non-trivial part is that the change points are unknown. And even more difficult is that this S is also unknown. You don't really know how many subgroups you have. You, you don't really know how many change points you have. So we needed to estimate the regression coefficients beta. So that's a regular parameter. So that's a parameter we usually care about. But in addition to that parameter, we also need to estimate the location, A, and also estimate how many A you need to decide. So this is a 
model we are going to care about. So in the previous work, <coughs> uh, in the previous, so this is not a new model actually. In the previous, uh, one of my previous theoretical work, we have studied this model uh, very rigorously already. So in that in that model, in that paper, we uh, developed uh, two stage multiple change point detection methods for this model, and uh, we are able to estimate the number of change points uh, <clears throat> uh, with a strong consistency. So the the number of change points can be estimated almost surely, and the locations can also be estimated almost surely. Uh, question. Oh, sorry. Yeah, exactly. I forgot. So I was going to the mathematics too quickly. So perhaps here I need to declare, right? This model is actually quite general. It can incorporate uh, both prognostic and predictive uh, signatures in this kind of framework. So if you have a treatment, you can actually just imagine treatment is one of the X variables. Okay, so it can be applied in this way. So if just so usually for treatment selection, for treatment recommendation, when you are recommending different treatment is because the reason is because you are thinking the treatment effects are different for these different groups. Okay, so this X variable could actually incorporate all kinds of treatment variables. Okay, but in addition to treatment variable, X can also include the prognostic factors. So many other things could be included in these X variables. That's a good question, yeah. So in the previous models, we assume Z as uh, observed. But in this project, uh, we also assume uh, the data are observed, but Z has to be constructed from the observed data. The that's right, yeah. That's a new development here. That's a new, only new thing, <laughs> actually. That's right, that's what I'm telling you how to construct Z later. Yeah. You can do that. You can, I think this X can also include the interaction term as well. Yeah. So it's not limited to any types of vectors, of variables you want to consider. So any predictor variable, you can put it inside. And we can also allow some of the variable to be uh, um, uh, varying over the subgroups. Some can remain constant. So we can allow high dimension also. We can allow high sparsity as well. So in our original work, it's a theoretical paper, so it's actually can cover all kinds of situations. Okay, so we can estimate, so we are uh, assured that the number of change points can be estimated, and the number of the location of change points can also be estimated. Okay, very, don't worry about that. And most importantly, the regression parameters can also be estimated consistently and they enjoy the oracle property. The oracle property means, okay, if you know the true value of A, J, and S, and in that situation you apply least square, that kind of estimator is called an oracle estimator. So for that kind of oracle estimator, we know it's just a least square estimator, so it has all the asymptotic normality, it has all the nice properties. And it's very good under our principle, under our methods, our methods, mm, I will also tell some details later. Our, under our methods, we can also find out the coefficients, just like we know the locations. So don't, it's quite a general framework. And also in the and gene, the, in this paper, we can allow the response variable to be censored uh, survival time variable. So in, the, in that case, this linear regression model just becomes the accelerated failure time model. Okay, although the proof the, the argument is slightly more complicated. You have to use some counting process language to show the consistency. But we can indeed uh, do that. So in terms of implementation, implementation and the uh, theoretical argument, there's already no problem with this uh, model. Okay, so just to be simple, what are, what are the two stages <laughs> for this uh, estimation problem? So these two stages, including the first stage of splitting the observations, 
into uh, multiple groups. So at that stage, we are actually doing some kind of penalization. We try to assume there are QN that many sub, sub that many subgroups. You can you can let this QN uh, this QN is kind of like a tuning parameter. You can let the QN to be very very large, and then okay for each piece for each segment. So you have QN that many segments. For for each segment, you can estimate one regression coefficient change. That change is like the jump at the change point. Okay, so we basically just penalize the jump. If the jump is penalized to be zero, then we would uh, uh, declare there's no change point at that point. Otherwise, if, if it's not a zero, if the jump is not a zero, then we would identify one change point at that particular location. So we just do this penalization idea uh, in the first stage. But this stage, the results may not be very accurate, even though it's kind of, um, it will give us, lead, lead us to the, uh, very, very close to the truth, but it's still not very accurate. So we have one additional step called a refining step. So the second step is even more complicated. It just involves the, uh, the cumulative sum methods again, the binary segmentation methods again. But this method, as I told you earlier, it's usually very time consuming. But uh, because we have the first stage, the first stage we use the penalization methods. So that method is very fast. So because of the, we have the first stage, we can do the second stage more efficiently. So, <coughs> so after the second stage, we refine the number of change points and all the analysis um, results. We can actually achieve the estimation results much better. So these are the basic ideas of this two-step multiple change point detection method. Okay, now here, <laughs> to address the question just asked, uh, just from the audience. Um, here, we, we have this Z variable. This Z variable is our thresholding variable. So normally, in many situations, Okay, we can assume this Z is given. So just like in the previous work, we assume Z is given. However, okay, if you, in, in practice, okay, the choice of this variable could be very important. And uh, how you choose this variable will actually lead to how you interpret or identification of the final subgroups. And those subgroups will be defined according to this Z variable. So if you don't choose this Z, Z variable wisely, okay, you may end up with very poor uh, subgroups. So we have to think about how to select this Z variable uh, more appropriately. So in this paper, we don't have any proof. <laughs> we don't have any theoretical results. We only suggest a few uh, practical ways to construct the threshold variable. The first approach is just to choose one of the covariates to be the threshold variable. That's kind of like the regression tree methods. Regression tree method is also uh, selecting one of the existing covariates to be the splitting variable. Okay, so <laughs> you do this, and uh, you, you can use some kind of optimality criteria and see uh, which, uh, which covariate can give you the best uh, result. So in this, this method, the threshold variable Z is just one of those X variables. You can use x1 or x2 or others. So that's the first method. The drawback of this method is just this is the variable only contain information from one a single covariate. So it might miss information from other variables. Okay, so the second method we introduce here is to uh, consider a weighted average of all the covariates. So this way you can Combine, you can combine all the x variables um, together. Okay, you can have all the information from all the subjects, from, from, from all the variables. Okay, so in the second uh, method, if you don't have any prior experience, if you don't have any prior information, you can treat all the x variables equally well. So this, you can actually just use average. <laughs> you can just uh, use, use w to be equal weight. So that's actually what we are going to use for this second method. So we consider equal weights for all the variables you want to consider. So this second variable is slightly better than the first one since you, now you can combine more information to be used for the underlying variable. Okay, but equal weight may still not be a good idea. 
because these variables, x, these x variables, clearly some of them may be more important and some of them may less, may be less important. So they could, uh, uh, you should have some kind of uh, favoring over them. So the third method we consider is actually very simple. We consider the multivariate analysis from, we think about multivariate analysis, we realize there is a very classical approach called the factor analysis. And this factor analysis basically is operating on the design matrix X, okay? For this design matrix X, you can do the, this kind of multivariate uh, orthogonal decomposition, and you can decompose this, <laughs> original x variable into many, many factors. Okay, this f quantity, they are called the factors. So if you are, uh, I believe this is usually covered in undergraduate curriculum already. So it's quite a classical approach. We, we also have R, soft, R, R also have com, uh, software function that can do the factor analysis automatically. So it's very straightforward. So the nice thing about the factor analysis here is after you do the factor analysis, the original matrix X, X involve P predictors, okay? All the predictors are included in this uh, original matrix. It's P dimensional. Uh, but, each, uh, but each one of this F, so this F is usually of a much smaller dimension. And uh, so usually the first factor and the second factor, they are usually like the most important ones. And the, 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 the other factors, so if they sort, you sort them according to the eigenvalues, so the first few factors usually they are more important. And so here, the, our third recommendation is we recommend you choose the thresholding variable to be the factors, to be these latent factors. Okay, so these latent factors are directly extracted from the original data, from the original X variable. So these factors, depending on the loading, they actually play, well, will actually assign different weights to the different variables already. So each factor is already constructed based on a linear combination of X, but the weight is constructed based on the factor analysis. Okay, so it's a very automatic procedure. And those weights automatically incorporate the consideration of like the variance, like the information of, of your data sets. So it's a very simple idea. And uh, so in here, we can do the factor analysis to X very easily. And uh, <clears throat> just, uh, I just want to briefly mention that uh, in practice, you see, this is actually recommended by a referee when, when our paper was reviewed. Uh, the referee actually said, when you do the factor analysis, so you put all the X variables into this uh, matrix to do the factor analysis. Uh, why don't you also put a Y into this X <laughs> matrix? Okay, you just include a Y into this matrix. And then you do factor analysis again and choose that factor. And that factor might be more relevant to Y, right? So you think this is maybe a good idea. And operationally, there's no difficulty doing that. I can do that. I can do that kind of computation. But the problem is, um, if you look at our model, if you look at our model, the factor, if you choose the factor in this way, so now your Z will be our factor. And this factor is constructed not only from X, it's also constructed from Y. So Y will appear on left-hand side and also right-hand side. Okay, if we insist using a statistical model, then I would not allow Y to be on the right-hand side. <laughs> Otherwise, it's very hard to interpret this model. This model is not interpretable. So I actually didn't follow the reference advice for this paper. Okay, of course, operationally in the future, if you just want to do subgroup analysis. If you don't care about model, then it's okay. You can definitely okay, do factor analysis using Y in this sense. Okay. It could be some kind of um, a supervised uh, uh, learning, right? There is some, there some, there's some kind of supervised machine learning approach in that defined in that way. Okay. The, the fourth method, of course, since you can use factor analysis, you can also use PCA. So principal component analysis is slightly different from uh, 
factor analysis. <coughs> I think factor analysis is care more about the orthogonal uh, relationship between those factors. And the PCA is caring more about variance. It's also the it's also decomposing the original design matrix X. So the, uh, the X variable is decomposed into multiple uh, principal components. And uh, here, the first uh, principal component, usually it maximizes the variance of all the linear combination of these X variables. Yeah, so that's the first uh, eigen, uh, that's the first uh, principal component. The second component also maximizes all the linear combination of X conditional on that uh, the f second uh, the second uh, mm, principal component is orthogonal to the first principal component. So we, you can you sequentially solve this kind of maximization ma maximi maximization uh, a problem, and then you end up with a PC1, PC2, and PC, uh, so on, okay. So this PC, are, they are also orthogonal. So PCs are different from factor, but they can also be regarded as a linear combination, also kind of like a linear combination of all the X variables. And it's also very easy to construct. In R, you can also use <laughs> existing software to compute all the uh, PCs. And we would recommend you use the first PC to be the thresholding variable because the first PC contains the most information. It has it captures the most variance. So comparing method three and method four, uh, the strength of method four is um, it can actually be extended to high dimension. You see, for method three, it's a uh, traditional factor analysis. It can only be used for n smaller uh, and bigger than p okay but for fact for pc for principal component analysis you can actually do high dimensional data you can apply that uh, to high dimensional data even if your n is smaller than p pc can still work okay in that case you can do the singular value decomposition that's a special type of pca so in r it also has a, this svd function you can use so that you can find out the uh, thresholding variables. Okay, so those are the four recommendations we make to find out the thresholding variables. And after you have the thresholding variable, you can then go ahead and fit uh, this regression model again and uh, get the estimated uh, subgroups. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Now uh, I want to show you a few simulation results. So in this first set of simulation results, we assume data are generated. Okay, so the data are generated from a regression model. But most crucially, we want to make sure that X variables, they indeed follow some kind of factor structure. So we gen when we generate predictors, we also generate predictors from some kind of factor model. So this is a very popular factor model where uh, people usually use to generate the data. So you have some kind of un underlying uh, factors F, which follow some kind of multivariate normal distribution. Mm. Yeah, they are IID. And then you use F to construct X. And then from X, <coughs> yeah, X is just another linear combination based on normal distribution. And then based on X, we can consider different scenario to generate Y. So in case one, <coughs> in case one, <laughs> we consider generate x, uh, generate y from x using this one equation. In this equation, we don't have any subgroup. So this is actually important in all the subgroup analysis problem, in the sub, all the subgroup identification problem, it's most important that you must protect your type one error. Okay, you cannot, uh, you cannot, uh, it, because in this kind of calculation, it's very like, it's very easy to get a false positive. Okay, if you don't have group, if you don't have subgroup and you declare there is a subgroup, then that's called a type one error. Just like in hypothesis test, you have some kind of force positive. So that's why usually we have to check, okay, we have, we have to make sure there is, when there is no subgroup, our method should still work well, okay? Otherwise, you have, you bring some kind of force positive to the procedure. So that's the first case. In the second case, we consider two subgroups. So in this case, we use F, we use the, the in the true model, the, split, the splitting factor is the first factor we used to generate X. 
Okay, so this true model follows this pattern. The two group, the two groups are actually defined according to uh, this f. And since here we have four predictors, so from f we actually generated four x variables. So in these graphs, I showed you the scatter plots <coughs> of y against uh, these four predictors. And you can al already see that uh, for some variables, it seems for x3 and x4, these two groups are separated quite well. And in case three, it's slightly more complicated. So that's what I showed you at the beginning of today's lecture, <laughs> to, uh, today's talk. Okay. Uh, in this case, we have three groups. And uh, uh, these three groups are also defined according to F, the first uh, uh, factor. And uh, we have two cut, uh, change points here, so that we have three groups. Okay, the third method is when we have some kind of binomial, a baloney random variable, u here. This u is kind of like a treatment variable. So that this, in this case, we are actually simulating an uh, example that is similar to a clinical study, a clinical trial, where you have treatment selection. So for treatment variable, it's usually a binary variable. So this u is generated from binary data. And still, there are, it's like there are two groups in this scenario. Okay, so those are the data generating mechanism for our simulation. So I didn't show, show you the, all the simulation results. I just show, I just selected one piece where sample size is total one, one, is 300. Okay. For the first case, in the first case we have no subgroup. Okay. In that case, you the, the the number of change points should be zero. There shouldn't be any change point. So if you look at this column, the the last column, this this is where we report how many subgroups you identified in average. Okay, so we compared it with many methods in the literature. So AIM method, CBT method, pre method, and MOB methods, those are all existing methods in the literature. They have R package as well, so we just use their R functions. And, and then this F1, F2, TSM, CD are our methods, our proposed methods. So what's the difference between F1 and F2? Do you remember? <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. Thanks for reminding. Okay, there are two two way two two estimation methods for factor. So in R in R, there are one method is based on a maximum likelihood estimation. Another method is called the Thompson method. So there are two uh, methods. One is more unbiased than the others. Okay, so F1 and F2 stands for these two estimation methods. Okay, so those are our methods. And LM method is just assume linear model. You don't do any sub subgroup analysis. So it seems in, for the first case, the, there shouldn't be any subgroups. The truth should be one. Okay, the truth should be one. So indeed, our methods identify there is no subgroups. Okay, pretty close. And MLB is also quite okay. It only slightly larger than one. But the other methods, it seems they insist there are two groups. So the other methods are all wrong. Even, even when there is no subgroup, they still try to split the data into two groups. Okay, so those are <coughs> the number of change points. And then the first two columns are the mean square error for the training sample and for the test sample, respectively. And you can see, <coughs> in this case, LM is actually the oracle method because the, the true model follows the, li the linear regression model. So linear regression model indeed perform the best in terms of uh, MSC, uh, actually not necessary. So for a training sample, it seems some uh, machinery methods that are much better. They have much better uh, training sample error. But for test sample error, they are worse. Those methods are worse because they incorrectly split, split the data into different groups. And for test sample, our methods and linear model methods are pretty close. We are all quite, we, we have much smaller MSC. So this is the case one. And case two, case three, and case four, we all have subgroups. And you can see the true groups numbers and our estimated group numbers are pretty close. And also in terms of mean square error, our methods also always perform uh, less best than others. So using fact, our factor models, 
Okay, our methods can indeed do quite well. So we also have other stimulation studies. So, and we have checked uh, many other scenarios as well. And uh, the observations are kind of similar. So let's move to the final example. <coughs> okay, so the example is from Wenqi. So Wenqi is our long time collaborator from UCLA, and he has this kind of very wonderful uh, data set from a um, scleroderma trial, uh, he, which he's, he was involved in that clinical trial. And so in this trial, uh, the response variable is this MRSS score. This is kind, kind of a measurement for the patients, which measures the severity of the disease. This is a primary outcome variable. <coughs> and uh, we have a, a few predictors in this data sets, including disease progression, index of pain, health assessment questionnaire, patient self-assessment of disease progression, non-performance, and age. So all these variables are used as our predictors. So in this <coughs> case, we will mm, do analysis based on this data. So let me think. This is our estimated results. We use the different types of methods. And eventually, <coughs> our factor-based methods, in average, we have, oh, we, we, uh, we actually did a, did a random simulation, and we repeat the, um, we do the training and test the sample. This, this way, we do it separately. We do the cross validation so that we have training sample and test the sample. And when we check the performance of MSC resulted from using this different subgroup analysis. Because, <laughs> so in this project, what we, uh, the criteria is actually based on prediction. Based on, if you have a better, so we believe if you have a better uh, subgroup structure, if your st structure is better, then you can actually predict the outcome better. Okay, so in that case, MSC should be smaller. So that's uh, something we want to look at. In, in this case, because we don't really know how many subgroups there are. So this S is really, we don't know. It's just based on different methods. It can give us different method, uh, different uh, number of groups. But uh, indeed, uh, who is better, who is worse, we perhaps have to look at the uh, MSC. So in this case, we find out the factor model-based uh, MS, uh, the factor model-based uh, <laughs> change point method is actually provides us like the smallest, smaller uh, MSC. Actually, linear model is not that bad. Linear model, even linear model is quite good in this case. This is the first example. Okay, in the second example is a high dimensional <coughs> data. In this case, we have <coughs> gene expression data from uh, 24,000 genes. So those are the predictors. And then we have only 97 subjects. It's a very small data set. Oh, it's a very small number of subjects, but the data set is large. Okay, we have many predictors. <laughs> okay, so in order to analyze this data, we consider several approaches. In the first approach, we try to do some kind of bootstrap. We, each time, because our procedure, we cannot afford to do cal calculation for 24,000 genes in our uh, algorithm. I don't think any of the algorithm uh, can incorporate that many genes, that many predictors. So what we did here is we do uh, this kind of bootstrap. We bootstrap 500 times. Every time we randomly select, we randomly pick only 20 genes to fit the model. So that's what we do. So we pick 20 genes every time. And then we try all these different methods. And, and each time with these 20 genes, we can do the subgroup analysis. We can do the subgroup identification by using existing methods and our methods. <clears throat> and uh, we repeat this 500 times, and then we look at the average performance. So in this way, we hope that this 500 bootstrap, of course, you can do a much longer time. Bootstrap is affordable. We can make this longer. But here, we only report results from 500 times. Okay, hopefully, this 500 bootstrap can cover, uh, can cover this 24,000 genes, all of them. Okay. So each time, we have 20. So if you look at these results, Mm, we can can see that uh, in terms of number of subgroups, 
we actually have yeah we could end up with quite a different number of um, results. If you use existing methods, the number of uh, subgroups is only two, and using only a single so one TSMCD. This is the method we introduced today as the first method. And ATSMCD method is our second method where we take equal weights to all the variables. And F1, F2 are the third methods where we use factor, factor analysis to find the threshold in variable. And PC, TSMCD is the, not the fourth method where we consider principal components. So those are our proposed methods. <coughs> and you can see our proposed methods usually can recommend more subgroups than the existing methods indicate we have we tend to be more sensitive in detecting the number of subgroups and in terms of accuracy also it seems the factor based methods has like the lowest or actually pc has the lowest msd mse the smallest mean square error so in terms of accuracy our proposed method is also performing quite well and this Last column reports the average time you spend to fit each model to get the subgroups. Okay, so in this case, linear model. <coughs> oh, anyway, so this is the first analysis. In the second analysis, we choose 28 genes. Uh, this is actually a very old data set. This is a public available data set. So it has been an analyzed by many earlier authors already. So we just use 28 genes selected by other authors. So just use those genes as our predictors. And we, in this uh, analysis, we use the results from my colleague's paper, Yu Tao's paper in 2011. Okay, in that paper, we select 20 genes based on our C analysis. And then uh, we repeat the same calculation for all the methods. And still it seems our methods perform quite well among all the uh, results. It seems our method tends to uh, have smaller MSC. The next, the last method is also based on the earlier, uh, earlier author's results, where in, in this 2016 paper, they identified the four markers from this data set. And so we use those four markers to construct uh, the uh, subgroups. And uh, we end up with this kind of MSC. It seems PC is quite good in this case. Okay, so the existing methods are also quite good. I, I'm not saying here that our method is always better than the existing method. You see, in some situations, the existing methods are also quite good. But I think the advantage of our method is that we can provide a model. We can provide a statistical model to provide a better interpretation. We can actually say how these different subgroups are defined. We can talk about the subgroups. We can give a clear definition. Some of the existing methods, they couldn't even tell you how to write down the definition of different groups. They don't have models. So that's one thing that's really not, not that pleasant. Okay, so those are the main works I want to summarize, I want to share with you today. So finally, I just briefly mention what kind of future work I plan to do. So first, this model is very simple. It's still a parametric model. Clearly, a parametric model is too restrictive. Sometimes you may even consider a non-parametric model like a previous speaker. You can consider B-spline. You can consider all kinds of spline models as well. So definitely, it fits that kind of framework very well. You can try that kind of, we perhaps can do that kind of analysis as well. And also, uh, causal inference is quite important, especially in computing technology. And so I'm also thinking that for observational studies, when you cannot uh, have uh, a golden standard, uh, if you want to do some causal inference, you can also try to do this kind of subgroup analysis. Even so, now I don't have a very clear idea of how to do that yet, but I seem to find that there is some connection over there, and you may want to uh, look into that. And finally, we are still developing the software, and we hope that our package will be ready soon, and then you can use the package directly to do the, all the calculation. So that's all. Thank you very much.
Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yeah, we we indeed we have tried many uh, situation. When because in this kind of um, situ, in this kind of uh, subgroup methods, we believe there is a true model. So in that true model, uh, there is a true underlying factor, underlying latent variable there. So in the simulation, we just pretend we know. Uh, in this simulation, I, I showed. I just pretend I know the true variables. I also have have done some kind of uh, uh, analysis where we don't know. Yeah, we don't really know the true, the true underlying variable may be misspecified. Okay, in those situations, what I can tell you is, um, so first, the, the number of groups, this seems to be still okay. If you use a factor or use PC to do that kind of approach. If your, your true, if the true variable is kind of parallel to those PC or factor variable, parallel means they are correlated. Okay, if they are correlated, then sometimes they can still identify pretty well. If they are completely unrelated, then it's, it will be wrong. It will be very hard to do. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah, we need to cons indeed worry about the misspecification. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Probably, and uh, maybe even put the instrument instrument variable somewhere <laughs> in the model. So that's just a very rough idea. You know, when I when I was writing these slides, I was suddenly think I should I can put this in <laughs> since I'm in this workshop so for so long. <laughs> I heard you guys talking about this so much. I was just curious, like, so you look at MSP as yeah. So we predict, but how good are your estimates of beta? Beta, huh? Uh, yeah, I didn't check for beta because there are quite many betas in the model, so I didn't check individually. Um, um, yeah, it could be related. If um, if you can estimate beta well, then you can predict y well. So usually that's a logic <laughs> connection. But here we only check the final consequence. We only check the y, and uh, yeah, I think so. We yeah, we can also check beta. Yes, because the, in terms of beta, I think in our previous paper, we already showed the regression coefficient. They can indeed uh, be consistent. Well, as long as you, if your, if your z is correctly specified, then, then you, we, have, we do have consistency for beta. Yeah. But this is new, of course this is new. We haven't done any thing on that yet. Beta J. Hmm. Do you mean you want you want to make sure this term is significant? Right. 
Mm. Yes. yes. Okay. So in in order to for this theoretical results to hold, we need some technical conditions. One of the technical conditions is this beta j plus one minus beta j must be non-zero. <laughs> okay. The, 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 otherwise, the change point is not different, is not identifiable. Okay. We must make sure there is a jump. If there is no jump, then it's not that there is no change point. So that condition requires is required. There must be a jump. Yeah. So this is a model we believe exists. So we believe that data, the model must follow, follow this kind of structure. Okay. If if you so in this model in our procedure we don't we don't really know if there is change point right. I also showed you some simulation result when there is no there is no subgroup we can indeed find out there is no subgroup. We we won't overestimate the number of change point. Yeah. So we we indeed checked on that side. <laughs> Yeah, we do need to worry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yes, x. Some of the x can be con continuous, can be categorical. You can copy the. Yes. Oh, oh, you mean PCA? Oh, that's a good question. Because for PCA, it's usually only for continuous variable. Factor analysis also only for continuous variable. So here we only consider continuous variable. For categorical variable, you cannot do this. Okay, you have to uh, consider ad hoc methods to incorporate them. 